This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 194. Today, CJ and I are doing a quick little review of the first day of the Build Keynote live from the Seattle, Washington Conference Center on May the 10th, 2017. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Microsoft Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, and the competitive landscape and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Andrew Connell. And I'm Chris Johnson. Send us a tweet, either to the show at MS Cloud Show or to Andrew at Andrew Connell. Or Chris at Loungefly Z. As we'd love to connect with you. We're just two dudes telling you how we see it. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid.nl. Valid's motto is stay ahead. Its mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of IT. Valid is always on the lookout for new colleagues. Are you interested in all things happening in Azure, whether in infrastructure, SQL Server, Office 365, BI, SharePoint, or .NET? Look them up on valid.nl. Hey, CJ, how's it going? Better than the Azure AD team. Oh, man, that was a little bit of a fire <laughs> going on a minute ago, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, so first, I am at uh, Build, obviously. The Build conference is on in Seattle right now. Uh, we're at the Washington State Convention Center with, I don't know, probably four, 4,000, 4,500 folks. Uh, first day, we've gone through keynotes this morning. Right after the keynotes, uh, I had some alarm bells come come on in our monitoring system for Hyperfish. And uh, our team looked into it. And sure enough, Azure Active Directory login, which powers Microsoft Teams, Office 365, the Azure portal, the whole nine yards was dead on arrival 504s so yeah. i guess somebody you could at say microsoft it was just down. a bad day yes. microsoft yeah, was, was down <laughs> it was down fully down it was totally dead so um, yeah. it's back online now but i bet there were there were pucker factor went to 12 for all the uh, session presenters prepping their demos for this afternoon sessions yeah, that's, uh, I had that happen actually uh, last November. So I was uh, presenting and all of a sudden I couldn't get into Office 365 because, or sorry, I could not do Exchange Online went down uh, and I was trying to fight with it. Someone raises their hand and they're like, uh, yeah, Exchange Online just went down. It's all over Twitter. I'm like, oh, well, that's fun. So there, we, that, there goes that part of the demo. So thankfully it was only yeah. down for a few minutes, but at yeah, any rate. still brutal. Uh, yeah, what a day. For, well, any day is bad for login to go down, I guess, but um especially for all our demos and presenters. Absolutely, yeah. So, hey, today you are at Build uh, live in Seattle. I am yep. uh, at home uh, over in Florida, uh, and we wanted to just take a few minutes here and kind of recap what we saw uh, for the keynote today uh, and a quick little you know, out-of-band episode that we want to go through and publish uh, as quick as we can. Uh, and I'll try and get this out later on today. But... Uh, we wanted to just kind of go cover some of the stuff, offer some of our thoughts, some of the bigger things here that were announced uh, or at least discussed at the keynote. So I think we're just going to dive right into it. Yep, um, that sounds sounds great. All right. So I guess the first thing we had was a, a bunch of stats that, you know, that Satya Nadella mentioned. Um, some things were a little uh, we'd seen before, but 100 million uh, Office 365 monthly active users, 140 million uh, monthly active users on Cortana, 12 million organizations are in Azure AD. So 12 million people were a little frustrated a minute ago. 90% of the Fortune 12, 500. Uh, sorry, it was, it was 10 million organizations. Oh, I thought people. it was 12. Oh, I said it was 12 million uh, organizations. In organizations, Azure. sorry. Yes. Yeah, organizations, yeah. not not people. Yep. Right, right. And then 90% uh, of the Fortune 500s are using the Microsoft Cloud. So Microsoft, just you know, just an update on stats there. Yeah, uh, really but, interesting stats, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did think, uh, I guess overall before we, we do this, I, I did think that the keynote today was significantly better than both the keynotes last year. Um, I was really inspired by there are probably four big demos that I know that I'll, I'm going to pick out that I thought were some of my favorite things that we saw today. Yeah. Uh, and I'll get you to chime in on yours as well. But I think the first thing that we saw was a, uh, a talk about Azure IoT Edge, a new thing that uh, mm -hmm. was showing some stuff off. The um, uh, was, idea was basically to be able to have it run on Windows and Linux and be able to en essentially enable cloud functionality to be exported and run and managed, not just from Azure, but exported down and run on the IoT devices uh, themselves. What, what did you think about this? Yeah, so in a nutshell, it's an on-prem connector. Right, it's it's the Azure team uh, and Microsoft saying, 
hey, IoT happens on-prem a lot and you can't afford for the cloud to disappear if you've got offline scenarios or the network goes down or what have you, and some stuff just needs to be on-prem. So I thought it was an interesting development. I think uh, AWS has something similar in the space for deploying and being able to run like lambdas and things like that locally um, for IoT scenarios. So it's kind of a response to that, I feel. But yeah, really interesting development. I guess for me, it was like a, a bit of a capitulation on Microsoft's part to say, hey, the, the cloud is only part of the story. You're going to have on-prem stuff. We need to stretch the cloud, at least in a connectivity sense, to code that runs on-premises as well for the foreseeable future. And this is kind of their um, foot in the door on that stuff. Yeah, it seemed like a, a bit of a, uh, not so much, not like an Azure Stack kind of an offering, but for devices that are that are going to be running that need to do things they need like monitor certain things like pumps or or i guess in the demo we saw was a piece of machinery that when it runs outside of a certain threshold they need to do an emergency shutdown on it and if the cloud isn't available they can't have this million dollar piece of machinery uh basically just fry itself because it can't act on its own and so at least giving a little bit of that health check and monitoring stuff and reaction uh, to the device, but still, you know, relying on the cloud for the majority of the, the processing and stuff of all the analytics. Yeah, exactly. And and they, they gave the scenario of a ship out at sea as well. Mm. And even though satellite connectivity is good in those scenarios, there's situations where, you know, there'll be a storm at sea and they, they lose satellite connectivity to the internet. And it'd be really bad if there were a whole bunch of processes that couldn't be run on the ship because of that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's very true. While many IT teams struggle with the impact of deploying Office 365, Zscaler customers are experiencing 40% or greater network performance across file download times, as well as TCP and DNS connection times, compared to using next-gen firewalls and UTMs to route Office 365 traffic locally to the internet. While you may know Zscaler as the leader in cloud security, they also have hundreds of customers who are processing over 1.2 petabytes of Office 365 traffic monthly through the Zscaler cloud. Visit www.zscaler.com to learn more. Yeah. yeah, so the next thing that we saw was, uh, they called it digitizing the workspace. And I know this was a lot of using some of the AI stuff and the vision uh, API they have in cognitive services uh, that they did where they showed uh, a, a mock workspace of like a, you know, a, a spot like out like a work site, construction site um, yeah. on stage. And they showed how it was able to identify different elements um, on the screen or in the in the picture, like a jackhammer or an individual or something like that, and how it could do certain detection of different issues and stuff like that. Yeah, that was really cool. That was a really nice showcase of this sort of technology being used in a real world scenario that didn't totally suck. You know, like the HoloLens demos when they first came out with HoloLens, there's a guy or a woman, can't remember, can't, can't remember which, working on some jet engine and it was all sort of exploded and I was like, yeah, I mean, I get it, but it's not exactly that practical. Whereas this demo was really, you know, you could, there was a, I definitely had a sense of real, of practicality to it, which I thought was great. Yeah, something that could be applied today to actually impact people's lives or businesses uh, actually applied today and used today, not showing a you know an alien coming and spiders coming out of a wall that I can shoot with my HoloLens or something. Exactly. So. Yeah, and and although it was a little creepy that demo, where the demoer uh, you know added a rule that said you know jackhammers should not be left standing up; they should be laid down, and then the system detected you know, using the vision APIs and all that, detected when the jackhammer was left, you know, propped up against a wall in an unsafe position. Um, and then it sort of automatically sent an alert to some worker saying, hey, could you lie that jackhammer down? And all I could think of was like, wow, I bet they're going to be stoked about this technology telling them how to do their job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big brother at its best. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was a little creepy like that, but but really, yeah, very practical and, and uh, applicable. Yeah, agreed. Uh, the yep. next one that we saw, uh, that I thought that that, that was one of my num my top four, you know, things that I saw during the keynote today. I thought that was really impressive to show real world, you know, technology being used and applicable today. Uh, yeah. The next one though that we saw was something called Project Emma, and this mm. was this one blew my mind. Um, yeah. I actually, I, I, they, a, a woman from London who um, suffers from Parkinson's, uh, and a Microsoft researcher 
they essentially showed how they developed a device that was very much like a like a thick smartwatch. Uh, that uh, if you know if you're familiar with like noise cancellation technology, where you know you have an inverse of like the the sound wave uh, cancel mm -hmm. it out. It it and I'm not saying this is what they did, but effectively it did that. So she was able to draw a box and write her name without, I guess, the impact of tremors affecting her handwriting. Yeah, I thought that was just incredible. I was watch, I was seeing in the keynote, and I was like, oh gosh, I've managed. Oh no, I seem to have got a piece of dust in my eye. <laughs> oh, I wonder how that happened. Yeah, because <laughs> it, it was, it was that was, I think Sarch's overall point with that was, this is technology, actually impacting real people's lives, in a, in a, in a great way, right? Uh, to the benefit of humans, and, you know, not just because you can, but because you should, you know. Yeah, and I, I, I just watched, actually, right before we recorded this, I just watched uh, Seth Juarez from Channel 9 interview um, the Microsoft researcher who worked on this and the, the woman that was a subject of the, of the demo, Emma, um, that, and they did a cool little interview. She is planning on, she, find, she says that she finds herself drawing more. She's a creative director, so it's hard to go through and express yourself when you can't draw. And mm. she um, she was saying how she finds that she's drawing more now, just because it's she can and it's an enabling technology. And she's planning on doing a 365 day video blog or blog on her experience, showing how this is impacting her life and everything. So that is that is I, so I, cool. It was so cool. It was this this I think was my favorite demo, just because it showed and my my, my favorite part of the keynote because it was it it was so inspiring. It was it was really cool to see. You know, stuff that Microsoft is doing, changing someone's life for the better. Yep, absolutely. All right. So the next thing was the Scott Goo show, and he busted out with a bunch of stuff. I'll throw a couple of these at you because we're going to try and keep this up so quick, and I'll let you kind of, uh, or as quick as we can. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll throw a couple of these out at you. I'll let you kind of comment on some, and then we'll throw a few more out, and I'll you know kind of go back and forth. So uh, the first thing that he talked about was uh, three, two big things for Azure. Number one was the Cloud Shell, uh, which was basically taking the Azure CLI, cross-platform CLI, and it now runs in a Bash web-based console right inside of the Azure portal and a Azure mobile portal, which is effectively a Android and iOS uh, application that allows me to, it's, basically it's the portal, but it's in a mobile app with it works great for that form factor and it's got the cloud shell integrated inside of it yeah the cloud the, the shell was really cool if you haven't used the azure cli definitely go check out version two of it it's all python based now it runs um obviously does a lot of what v1 did but it kind of does it better but yeah manage it they've managed to get that running in a docker container in azure obviously and when you open up the cloud shell through the portal you get an http based you know web based um, Bash shell that that um, is already pre-authenticated with your with your Azure subscription and so forth, so you can just start typing commands straight away and you're in. I thought that was really sweet. Yeah, I loved it. I I, I went in. I, I'm a big fan of the CLI. I mean, I like the Azure portal. I do not care too much for PowerShell. It just doesn't. It's not me. Um, of course, it's not until just recently that it actually works cross-platform. Uh, but it's still. I mean, it's not a. I'm not as much of a fan of it. Um, hmm. But at any rate, I do. I like the fact that you know it's very cool that we have this inside of a inside of a, the uh, the Azure portal, so that I can run my scripts or I can you know create a thousand VMs if I want to create a thousand VMs like they demonstrated. But man, I grabbed the VM, I grabbed the the uh, iOS app, fired it right away, started playing with it, and was absolutely. I mean, I could jump right in. I had forgotten that I was supposed to check to see if two VMs shut down last night. I'm like, well, let me just use the app to do it, and sure enough, worked right away. Very nice. So. Very, very impressed with it. Really nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it'll it'll make it good. You, it it just takes one of those extra steps out of getting set up with the CLI. You can just open yep. the browser, log into your portal, boom, open up the open up the shell, and you're away. And you're all good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the next things we talked about were a little bit of a, a database kind of. I guess there was a announcing general availability for Visual Studio for the Mac, which included snapshot debugging. But then we had some database or some data uh, announcements. Some SQL big ones. Yeah, some really big ones. Uh, literally. 
Uh, SQL Server 2017 uh, is gone GA and shipping, and it releases yep. at the same time on Windows, Linux, and Docker. There's a new data migration service for zero downtime migration to take your SQL Server databases and move them to Azure. And yep. a new database as a service options, hosted MySQL, hosted PostgreSQL, and Azure Cosmo DB, which is the first globally distributed multi-model database service that is horizontally scalable, uh, paid for, consumption only. It's basically, it's a superset of what we could have done with Document DB. In fact, yep. it is Document DB. It's a new name because all of our Document DB databases have been migrated automatically over to uh, Cosmos DB. Yeah, that was obviously the real big one. SQL Server 2017, pretty cool. We knew that was coming. Linux, Docker, and Windows support, obviously, really nice. Postgres and MySQL, that's really interesting because um, that means that you know a bunch of startups and a bunch of companies that are building applications that want to use free databases, um, you know, have that support in AWS for MySQL and Postgres, um, and now can do it on Azure uh, in a similar kind of way. So that's that's really nice. Um, and then obviously Cosmos DB. Honestly, it was a really cool, cool announcement. But in some ways, I think it's Document DB renamed. And I think a lot of people don't understand what Document DB is because of the name Document in it. Mm. I think people expect you to upload files into it, and it's like some sort of file share. And that's not the case. It's it, it's documents, but it's doc it's JSON documents, right? Mm. Um, and in a NoSQL sense, so. I actually think they've done themselves a great service by by wrapping this up as Cosmos DB, um, rebranding, adding some more APIs around graph type APIs to call it um, to integrate with other things. Um, you've got the, obviously Mongo API support for it, um, and uh, and some, some some new APIs to get access to it. So I think it's really cool. I, I love the the whole geo redundant and and replicated stuff and leaving the developer in control of the trade-offs you make. Do you want, you know, because multi-master, geo-redundant and replicated data is really a very tough problem and you have to make a trade-off. You have to decide, do you want it to be fast or do you want it to be accurate? And Microsoft are letting you control some of that and saying, if you want it really, really fast, you can't also have it accurate in real time. But if you want it accurate, absolutely, then, you know, reads and writes are going to be a little slower. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm I'm a little I'm a little confused a little bit on, on what Cosmos DB is, why it's so much better than Document DB, aside from some really you know some really good um, service level agreements, some SLAs that they provide uh, for high availability, performance on latency and throughput and data consistency. But I mean, I guess to me, I need to I need to, I need to learn a little bit more about it. Um, the keynote it wasn't as descriptive on why is this so impressive or why is this such a great thing uh that i didn't have before so it's i mean it, it, it is a no sql database like what document db is uh, or was um it's not relational um I, I was trying to compare it to google's big announcement a couple of weeks ago of their new spanner uh, offering but spanner is relational so it's kind of like mm -hmm. spanner is what we have with sql or azure sql server um and so we'll have to see. Well, I'd like to get the the person I believe her name was Rima, uh, who presented it. I'd love to get her uh, on the podcast in the future to talk a little bit more and highlight what Cosmos DB is all about. Yeah, I mean, in the demo, if you saw when they created one of these new ones, the Azure portal, it, they were creating a Doc DB. You know, they go in, they give it a name, and it was dot documents dot Azure dot whatever it was. So I suspect it's just the you know. I think it's just the evolution of DocDB with some additional APIs on top of it um, and a rebranding. And um, you know, having said that, it was pretty pretty nice. Uh, yeah. The doc, the the explorer, the data explorer that they showed was pretty smooth. Um, the geo redundancy and deployment uh, UI for picking your regions and things was really smooth. Um, and obviously, the API support and being able to bring developers from whatever ecosystem across was is super important for adoption. So. Yep. If it is just document DB growed up, that's fine. And I think it'll help with the confusion by renaming it something too. Yeah, agreed. What if you could take any process your teams use to get work done and make it happen automatically? What if you could save countless hours and help people work better together? Nintex can make that happen. 
With the Nintex platform, work flows from person to person, system to system, to the cloud and back, and it flows in and out of the tools that you use every day. With Nintex, work flows so your teams can work smarter, work faster, and be more connected than ever. Uh, the next two thing, next thing we had was, I, I'm, I think we can kind of skip over this kind of quick, is that uh, Visual Studio announcements. You had Visual Studio 2017 for Mac, it went GA, I think I mentioned that a minute ago. Yeah. But then the other part was Visual Studio, I guess the big 25 gig one is uh, the, for Windows, uh, integrated Docker tooling, support for Azure Functions and Logger, Logic Apps. Uh, and then also, um, I guess this wasn't so much Visual Studio. To me, this wasn't a Visual Studio thing, but they grouped it in there, and that's Application Insights, Azure App Insights for uh, Azure Functions. So those are, that's, I, mm, I'm interested to play with that nice. a bit. Yeah, I'm looking forward to putting those on, uh, putting App Insights on the Azure Functions I've got to kind of see what kind of metrics we get out of that. Yeah, really nice. The next big thing, though, that we hit, and this was this contained the next two kind of wow uh, demos uh, for me was around. It's all it was all artificial intelligence, the AI and research stuff, and cognitive services. Um, this this to me was really slick. So we saw one demo where they used the vision. I, I believe it was the vision API to help like train uh, to do like very easy training for like classifying images. So the demo that mm -hmm. they had was, they had a bunch of images of different uh, tree leaves or plant leaves um, that they had already classified and said, you know, this is a rhododendron, this is a pine tree, this is an oak tree, palm tree, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they took a picture and uploaded it to the, um, to the service. And it said with X amount of confidence, I believe that this is a rhododendron, right? Yeah. Really yeah, slick. Custom, custom training AI models um, for photos in this case. Uh, yeah, really cool. Um, really useful for all sorts of things, I guess. Like they call these things custom services. So uh, skills. So was it skills, custom services Cu or skills? Yeah. 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 Um, and being able to sort of train your model, you know, upload a bunch of photos and tell it, you know, help it understand what they are and then, and then have an answer based on that. Uh, it's really nice. Yeah. I played with it a little bit already. I created it's a public preview. I created an instance of it, uploaded a few pictures of different African cichlids, which are a kind of fish, and then and classified them uh, with their names. And then I took a picture of two or three of the fish from my fish tank, and then uploaded it. And I was really surprised at how well, how quickly it was able to go through. Into I was able to train it, and then turn around how quickly it was able to uh, identify what kinds of fish these actually were. And I used. I, I was going for the low hanging fruit. So I took pictures of the fish from a book. And then I took a really good picture of one of my fish that matched the picture in the book. And it, it, it identified it right away, but yeah. I'm curious to play with this a bit more. And um, I don't know, it'd be kind of cool to see how to do identify Lego parts. That sounds really cool. <laughs> Gotta give that a shot. Yeah. But uh, then we saw uh, Yina Arenas take the stage. Uh, somebody we're, we're good friends with and do an absolutely epic, uh, demo on with PowerPoint, the translation service. Yeah, that was really impressive. Really, really impressive. So yeah, yeah she was she was showing an example where uh, in PowerPoint, you're doing a presentation in one language. And the translation services, there was an add in for PowerPoint that hooked up to translation services um, in Azure and and was doing the speech to text. Uh, but also, translating from one language to another. So I think she was speaking in Spanish and it was translating to English. Um, and then Harry Shum, who was uh, one of the Microsoft execs there, um, came up and demoed, not just presenter to, to audience, um, but that you could have the audience uh, ask questions in different languages and then have it translate back. So he asked it a question in Chinese, in Mandarin, I think, um, yeah. and had it translate back as well off, off his phone back to the presenter. So really nice example of um, the smarts, AI smarts and, and translation, but also hooking into a productivity scenario in, in office. Yeah, agree. I agree. Yeah, it was, it was, I love how, I mean, yeah, she presented in Spanish. It translated both on the fly to English, uh, closed captioning, and then it also translated to his phone where he was connected to it uh, I was translating in Chinese 
And then, yeah, when he recorded the question back on his phone, it showed up as English and also for her, it showed up as Spanish so that she could go through it. It was, I, I thought as a presenter, I'm like, I'm going to go present in Belgium in two weeks or in a week and a half. And yeah. I, I know that there'll be some people who are not, you know, English is a second language. So it would be really nice to be able to say, you know, someone just says, hey, just, you know, go ahead and present the way that you normally feel like you want to present and get it all closed captioned. So yeah, that's really you and I have You and I have both done training events <clears throat> where, you know, workshops where we've spoken for multiple days on a particular subject uh, to an audience that doesn't speak a stitch of English. Mm. <laughs> and and, and we've had to have translators do it. And it it's really awkward as a presenter to do that if you're not used to it. And um, an app like this would really help. Because absolutely. Yeah, absolutely yeah. would. Now I just need to have like the goggles with the, the, the uh, hollow lens to where I'm looking at someone and it's translating what they're saying on the fly. That would be pretty, yeah. pretty smooth. Yeah. So that was one demo. And I know she did another demo too, showing using the graph to suggest different meeting times and stuff too, which is pretty slick as well. Yes. But. Yeah. So that was that was a demo with Microsoft Teams, and you know um, Harry Shum was talking about conversational AI. So you know bringing all these things together in a productivity scenario for for you know something uh, for a useful scenario. And the, the example they showed was Microsoft Teams, um, and then you know working with different people and so forth, and then using the graph to go find people, um, talking off to LinkedIn to go find. Uh, information, uh, you know, people with particular skills in your network and suggesting them for jobs and then booking meetings through the graph and creating calendar appointments and stuff. Uh, it really sort of tied together um, a, a, an interesting scenario for people that, you know, are in businesses. And, and the majority of people at Build are, are in businesses, right? They, they're developers at particular companies. And so, you know, um, you know, I've had a pet peeve in the past that all the bot scenarios that we've seen from Microsoft over the last 12 months have seemingly mostly been consumer scenarios. And I, I was really impressed that they finally pulled finger and, and got a decent enterprise scenario with teams together. So that was that was really great to see. Yeah, it really was. It was a good thing. But um, Oh, and, and they announced the bot framework channel for Skype for Business, finally. Oh, really? I didn't see. I, I missed that part. That's That's big for you guys. I know you've been waiting for something like that. We have been waiting. We have some we have some bot stuff for Skype for Business, but let's just say it's suboptimal in terms of its implementation. Uh, <laughs> and we've actually been waiting to refactor it on the bot framework. Um, and uh, the Skype for Business bot channel has been sort of a critical component to that. So the guys back in the office at Hyperfish will be uh, furiously pulling their uh, bits and pieces together to go play with that. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Well, that pretty much. I mean, that that that's pretty much a wrap on everything that we saw during the keynote today. I I, I know that you know me personally. I was I was very impressed by. I think my my big things uh, that we saw today were stuff that is applicable today that could be used today. That was not. Um, that wasn't stuff to me. That was you know it was. I guess what do you say? It wasn't. Um, it wasn't like just so far fetched and feel like I couldn't leverage this stuff today. I mean, the fact that I could go right out and I could start training images to be able to classify uh, different types of tropical fish, that was impressive. The Project Emma was very impressive to me. Um, and then the, the stuff about the translation service that, that you know, using, using the, as, a power, as a, a PowerPoint extension, uh, the demo that Ian Arenas did. And I know Richard Desaria had a lot of stuff to do with that as well. Um, in the background to actually you know, implement the demo and stuff. I and mean, he was the ghost behind the scenes, you know, while they were, while they were doing the demo, I know he was mirroring everything that was going on in the back and stuff. But uh, overall, I was very impressed and looking forward to really, you know, of course, I really wish that they would have announced the spare time uh, in, pre in uh, preview mode so that I could start playing with stuff without, you know, having to impact the day-to-day -day stuff that I have to do today. But still very, very cool the stuff that they did. But hey, I think that's everything that we wanted to cover today. So if everyone just uh, stay tuned, we got some more stuff that we're going to be covering this week for the podcast uh, for covering up Microsoft Build. So with that, CJ, thanks a lot. And I will talk to you soon. Give CodeShip Pro a try. More teams than ever are using Docker and Linux for their .NET applications. 
CodeShip Pro is a fully customizable continuous integration and delivery service in the cloud with the best support for any team that is using .NET and Docker together and can run builds on Linux environments. CodeShip Pro comes with ready-to-use integrations for Azure, including Azure Container Service and more. It also offers a free, convenient local CLI tool that allows you to run your builds locally and is the only hosted CI CD tool that lets you build your own environment, giving you the most control and flexibility no matter what tool or stack you're trying to use. Check out CodeShip Pro's free plan that grants 100 builds per month, unlimited projects, and unlimited users. Open source projects are always free on CodeShip. Visit CodeShip.com today or check out CodeShip.com slash features slash pro to learn more. Did you like this episode? Please tweet about it and drop a five-star review in iTunes. Word of mouth recommendations are the most effective ways for us to grow the show, and we'd really appreciate it. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or an MP3 and provide a link so that we can sh- play your question on the show. Our theme music is brought to you by Keith Ritchie. For more information on Keith Music, head to music.kritchie.com. You can subscribe to us on iTunes and the Google Play Store by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook, searching for Microsoft Cloud Show, or on Twitter, at MS Cloud Show. And finally, sign up to our mailing list by heading over to our website and entering your email to interact with us, participate in upcoming interviews, and other cool stuff. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.